Good evening, everyone. Good evening. <laughs> Oi, I was rushing to get back. That was that was pretty nerve wracking. I was like, you know, I really need to get some food. And then I was like, oh, shit, it's rush hour. I'm not going to make it back by seven. And then I did. So that was a bonus. Anyway, so as the title implies tonight, uh, we have a, a kind of um, a, a, a topic that is unfortunately been really misrepresented um, by a lot of people um, in many ways. But it's something that's going to be kind of eminently effective uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. We just may not know. The problem is, as with most of the talk topics that I discuss here, that um, essentially the issue is is that there's something that bad then happens, right? Or that is going to happen, or that somebody has done something that is really unscrupulous. Uh, and instead of actually having a, a factual position, the internet is full of hyperbole. Um, it's pretty standard fare nowadays. You either have hyperbolic statements made by uh, a, a, a party for this position or this action, and then a hyperbolic position against it. Both are wrong, and you just never get the accurate information from it. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, net neutrality is something that very likely will be repealed tomorrow. Um, frankly, that's that's something we should get out of the way first. Is that the chair, current chairman, um, who was appointed before? First piece of misinformation: President Trump did not appoint or did not uh, appoint uh, Ajit Pai or as I like to call him, Egypt Pie, but that's a little Irish joke most people might not get. He didn't appoint him to the FCC. He appointed him as chairman. Um, Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, was the actual one who appointed him to the FCC as a commissioner years before Donald Trump was president. So let's kind of get that out of the way. Second thing is, is net neutrality is not a new thing. Uh, it was not fabricated in 2015 um it actually uh was has been around in different forms for the past i don't know like 20 years or something like that and uh, not 20 years we'll say 15 years um it's been around in various forms so uh, again that's the second piece on there is net neutrality is not new um as many people would have you believe that it just fa was fabricated out of thin air in the year 2015 and before that we had absolutely no restrictions on the internet whatsoever. It was all just uh, Wild West, as, as Egypt Pie would like to put it. Yes, I'm going to refer to him as Egypt Pie from now on. Um, just so you guys know, I have no problem with that. That's that's going to be great fun, at least for me. So, the what we're going to be going over, we're going to be going over some, a lot of information here. We're going to be covering, obviously, a lot of the talking points of net neutrality both for and against um, the position that people have taken and going to kind of dispel a lot of the misinformation on there. And we're actually going to bring up facts. We're also going to talk a little bit about antitrust, which is going to be kind of a central piece to this whole thing. Most people don't realize that, but really what net neutrality is all about is about antitrust. Um, and it was frankly is a very um, sadly underutilized uh, set of laws in the United States, especially when it comes to internet. Um, that's one of the keys on here is in general, technology has been a very poorly adopted um, industry for antitrust, um, which is why you have a lot of, uh, a lot of the business practices you do. So, in any case, without further ado, let's go ahead and let's let's kind of uh, snap on here first. Let's first discuss what the standard rhetoric for net neutrality is, what it does. Uh, and this is from SaveTheInternet.com, which is, this is essentially a kind of a, uh, a standard press bulletin that you see distributed many other places. Uh, this even has a, a standard image that we're going to get to in a moment that is um, nonsense, but... So, 
essentially how this goes down is this talks about, uh, you know, y you expect to be connected to what you want. Uh, you want to go to a website and you don't want to be barred going to that website just as much as if you were to of your own volition want to go to a restaurant you would have the expectation that you would not be barred from entering that restaurant uh, without due purpose for example trying to go into a restaurant nude in most places chances are they won't let you but other than that in standard legal fashion um, you should not be fettered from doing what is legally allowed for you to do as a free human being. That's what it tries to paint the picture as here. Um, and it says, in 2015, millions of activists pressured the FCC to adopt historic net neutrality rules that keep the internet free and open, allowing you to share and access information of your choosing without interference. Uh, not exactly. In 2015, it was just a reclassification of rules that were already existing. Um, that's something else that we're going to get into here as well, is what exactly is happening and all that. Um, so it says, but right now, this win is in jeopardy. Um, Trump's FCC chairman, again, like I said, he was appointed before Trump, so it really doesn't have much to do with Trump. Uh, Egypt Pie wants to destroy net neutrality because he is of a misinformed opinion that net neutrality is undue regulation. And we'll also get into that as well. Um, FCC voted to let uh, Pie's internet killing plan move forward. Well, they it was a pretty predictable vote. It was three to two because there's three. It, they've essentially turned it into a partisan issue where Republicans are against net neutrality and Democrats are for. So naturally, if you have of the five, um, you know, commissioners of the FCC, if three of them are Republican, then instantly they can vote for whatever they want and get it passed. And that's what they had. By the end of the summer, the agency was flooded with more than 20 million comments. Many of them were bots. And that's another problem on there. The vast majority of people commenting urged the FCC to preserve net neutrality. And this is a key thing. This is actually a very smart statement. The vast majority of people commenting urged them. 98% of actual individual comments on the website were for preserving net neutrality. That was actually a small percentage of the overall comments, most of which were actually bots. Uh, and yeah, that's that's fun thing. So, um, so net neutrality is the internet's guiding principle. It preserves our right to communicate freely online. No, it prevents ISPs from altering traffic. It doesn't preserve any right to communicate. It does not in any way protect your right to communicate online. If you knew your legal, uh, your legal laws and protections, you would know it's the First Amendment that pre uh, preserves your right to communicate online. However, websites that you might go to, those are private websites in many cases, in which case um, they probably withhold some right to, uh, to not um, be a platform for your speaking, which is another tricky topic that uh, I'm, the whole uh, civil rights versus freedom of speech thing, that's another tricky one. Uh, to be honest with you, um, many people that use the whole it's a private website thing, um, the law has actually been ruling against them in many cases, so that's not really a, um, not really a justifiable defense so far. Could be overturned. Anyway, um, net neutrality means the internet enables f uh, and protects free speech. Again, no it doesn't. The First Amendment protects free speech. It means the ISPs should provide us with open networks and shouldn't block or discriminate against any applications or contents that ride over those networks. Yes, sort of. Discriminate is a, a fun um, kind of inflammatory term there. Not really discriminating. They just can't throttle, slow down, speed up. They can't treat any traffic different than anything else. Just as your phone company shouldn't decide uh, who you call and what you can say on that call, your ISP shouldn't interfere with that. Um, they make a deliberate thing to your uh, comparison to your phone company, uh, specifically to your landline phone company, because cellular carriers aren't regulated the same way as landline phone carriers are. Weird. 
I don't know why that would be. <clears throat> Money. Um, but uh, your landline phone company is very heavily regulated because of a certain, uh, certain topic that we'll get into when we talk about antitrust. So without net neutrality, cable and phone companies, um, wrong, phone companies, not necessarily, um, but because they're regulated elsewise. Um, without net neutrality, cable and phone companies could carve the internet into fast and slow lanes. An ISP could slow down its competitors' content or block political opinions it disagrees with. Um, this is not true. Um, they can't block political opinions. That's against your First Amendment rights. So that would turn them in. That would <laughs> that would that would turn them into a, a whipping post for every politician on the face of the planet. However, this one slowed down its competitors' content. This is 100% true, and that's what we're going to get in and talk about here. ISPs could charge extra fees to the few company, uh, few content companies that could afford a page for preferential treatment. This is also true, and has happened already. Relegating everyone else to slower tier of service, this would destroy the open internet. Uh, in, a, in a matter of speaking, yes it would. So what would happen if we lost ne neutrality? And this is kind of one of our key focuses on here. The internet without net neutrality isn't really the internet. Well, no, it still would be an internet functionally. That's just not true. Unlike the open internet that's paved the way for much innovation and a given platform where two people who have historically been shut out, it would become a closed down network where cable and phone companies call the shots and decide which websites, content, or applications succeed. That's a hyperbolic way to put it, but not entirely untrue. It's got a bit of truth in there. It's kind of interwoven in there. There's no clear statements on that one. Um, companies like AT&T, Comcast, and Verizon would be able to decide who is heard and who isn't. Again, nothing that violates your First Amendment rights. You still have a right to freedom of speech, um, so they can't bar that. So, uh, yeah. The consequences would be particularly devastating for marginalized community media outlets who um, who have misrepresented or failed to serve. That's This is kind of an ironic statement. Uh, marginalized community m communities, media outlets, who does the editing there, um, outlets have misrepresented or failed to serve. So, no. Um, people of color, the LGBTQ community, indigenous peoples, and religious minorities in the United States rely on the open internet to organize, access economic and educational opportunities, and fight back against systemic discrimination. Um, I'm going to dodge, carefully dodge this one here. Again, not true, because it's not prevent blocking your First Amendment rights. So that's, that's, they're really, trying to um, color this to a specific subset of people who are known to be very um, vocal activists. So that's who they're tailoring this language towards. Uh, not true, but yeah. So um, in any case, let's, uh, we're, we're gonna kind of shy away from this guy from now here and actually get over to the history of net neutrality. So as, as it says there, as I've been kind of reiterating thus far, um, really what net neutrality is about is preventing preferential treatment of traffic from ISPs, right? That's really what it's about. So very frequently you'll hear uh, a, a common argument against net neutrality of um, that, uh, that by net neutrality existing, it allows the government to control what's on the internet. <gasps> no, it does not. All it does, it actually prevents anybody from controlling what's on the internet or from controlling the speed of traffic. That's all it does. It prevents anybody from, from adding any rules to it. It doesn't give the government right to do it. It doesn't give cable companies the right to do it. It's pretty much a rule that says, well, if I can't do it, neither can you. That's literally what net neutrality is all about.
no there's no uh giving in government control and they can censor you based upon this no uh these rules are specifically geared towards internet service providers uh and classifying them as as um basic service providers like telephone companies under title two of uh of these act that i can't remember oh my god i'm already embarrassing myself in any case so let's start at the beginning um, so there were actually rules in place uh, as far as back in, in, in the 90s, but most of that actually was uh, going towards the telecom companies. Um, however, that doesn't really apply here because, uh, as I said before, uh, unfortunately a lot of governmental laws, especially when it comes to antitrust, have not done the best of job keeping up with technology. Um, so in 2005, however, the FCC formally established the following principles to encourage broadband deployment and preserve and promote the open and interconnected nature of the public internet. Consumers are entitled to access lawful internet content of their choice. Consumers are entitled to run applications and use services of their choice, subject to the needs of law enforcement. Consumers are entitled to connect to their choice of legal devices that do not harm the network. Consumers are entitled to competition among network providers. <laughs> That's a fucking joke. Applications and service providers. Uh, and content providers. However, broadband providers were permitted to engage in reasonable network management. And that's something else. Um, so the reason why citations needed there is because there's not clear documentation, unfortunately, on a lot of this because a lot of them keep it kind of quiet. This mostly relates to a lot of your cellular phone companies that do what's known as data optimization, um, which a lot of you who uh, had unlimited, the uh, grandfathered unlimited plans with Verizon might be familiar with, where they deliberately throttle you um, whenever you use an excessive amount of data in the previous month. This was more or less a way for those cell phone companies to try to force you onto their tiered data plans at the time, rather than allowing you to stay on unlimited and use as much data as you wanted. They were losing money off of you and they wanted a chunk of the action. That's all it was. It had nothing to do with data optimization. It was entirely a cash grab. The truth is that if you think about it logically, the way da um, data caps and data optimization would uh, work, if they were having congestion issues, um, balancing your data on a monthly basis would have absolutely no effect. In fact, it would probably make the network connection or network congestion during peak times even worse. The reason why is because if I have a limited, if you know everybody's getting on prime time and and I'm getting on prime time plus a few other times, right? Um, and suddenly I have a limited amount of data at once, I'm probably gonna be just getting on during those prime times instead. You know, after you get home from your nine to five job, you wanna watch some uh, Netflix, watch some Hulu or what have you before you, or maybe, you know, game a bit before you uh, wind down for the night. That's when I'm gonna be doing my prime time, uh, you know, internet activity. I'm, not, I'm just going to not use it during other times when I might have, but I can get away with not doing it. That's what happens when you force me into a monthly constraint. Uh, conversely, if you had a daily budget, which if many of you remember way back in the day, the early phone companies such as AOL did that. They would have cheaper rates at night, but more expensive rates during the day, largely because they actually did have congestion problems. That was that was the way it was. There was a limited, uh, limited supply and a lot of demand for it back then. And then as cable companies most particularly got into it, that uh, that bandwidth became less and less of an issue and really didn't have a problem with congestion. Um, there might have been some areas that are heavily densely populated that do have congestion problems, but not across the country, especially if you have an ADSL provider or a cable provider in a rural area. They have the opposite of congestion issues. Um, oftentimes, though, they don't want to spend money to upgrade the infrastructure out there and they overcharge you like hell for what other people pay less for. Why? Because they have a regional monopoly. We'll get into that one later. In any case, um, it, 
Now moving forward on time, those were the basic rules that got passed in 2005. In 2008, um, they, <laughs> this is a big one on here, they for, uh, upheld a complaint against Comcast ruling that it had illegally inhibited users of its high-speed internet service from using file sharing software, uh, it was BitTorrent specifically. Um, the FCC imposed no fine but required Comcast to end such blocking in 2008. Uh, the chairman said that the order was meant to set a precedent that internet providers and indeed all communications companies should not prevent customers from using their networks in a way they see fit unless there is good reason. And here's the thing. This is the big deal on there. Should And, and this is actually touched on in the rules here uh, up above. Um, consumers are entitled to run applications and use services of their choice subject to the needs of law enforcement. And what that means is, is that um, Comcast is not allowed to infringe upon someone using BitTorrent to pirate movies. Yes, I mean as in pirate movies illegally. They're not allowed to arbitrarily slow that traffic just because they detect it's from BitTorrent to a pirate site. However... If law enforcement, on the other hand, or an agent uh, dealing with a legal, uh, under legal action, were to tell them to slow and or block that traffic, then they would be allowed to, because it's subject to the needs of law enforcement. This would be particularly handy if, uh, say, I was pirating something, Comcast got notified from the content odor of that copyrighted content on pirating and said, shut me down. They're allowed to do that. Um, debate whether or not that's the right way to handle that, but that's not really the, the topic of discussion here is that a legal entity is allowed to order Comcast to slow and or stop my service if I am pirating um, because that's under DMCA. That's uh, another rule entirely there. But, um, essentially, uh, they could not prevent it. In an interview, Martin said that we are preserving the open character of the internet. Uh, we are saying that op network operators can't block people from getting access to any content or any applications. Um, and then uh, Martin's successor, the next chairman, maintained that the FCC had no plans to regulate the internet, saying, I've been very clear repeatedly that we're not going to regulate the internet. The Com Comcast case highlighted a broader issue of whether new legislation is needed to force internet providers to maintain net neutrality, i.e. treat all uses of their network equally. The legal complaint against Comcast related to BitTorrent, software that was commonly used downloading larger files and piracy. Um, however, in 2010, the FCC revised the principles of the original internet policy statement and adopted the open internet order consisting of three rules regarding the internet. One was transparency. Fixed and mobile broadband providers must disclose the network management practices, performance characteristics, and terms and conditions of their broadband service. Number two, no blocking. Fixed broadband providers, as in cellular providers, are exempt here as a bunch of bullshit. Fixed broadband providers may not block lawful content, application services, or non-harmful devices. Broadband providers may not block lawful websites or block applications that compete with their voice or video telephony services. And no unreasonable discrimination. So... This is a very key point on here, and we're gonna like those. Most of those are pretty, pretty straightforward and simple on here. Um, however, this key right here is a pretty substantial one, and we're gonna actually be talking about it a bit more, most particularly Netflix. So Netflix, they've been around since the night. Most people don't realize that they're over 20 years old at this point. However, the the key on here is that back in the 90s, um, Netflix was starting DVD sharing, and they so they spread with their DVD sharing. It was very popular. It was like a uh, a remote rental service, right? Eventually, when they started to get into actual content streaming, however, their business exploded 
like they became revolutionary in the industry now youtube and other video streaming sites were around like that but they really just had cheesy videos like little short clips nothing substantial netflix revolutionized revolutionized the way that streaming content happened here's the thing is there was still video on demand services hell there's been uh, on demand channels around since like the 80s but netflix was a flat fee it was uh, just a small amount of money per month you have all these movies that you could stream right the problem is is that many people started canceling their their cable service and signing up for just netflix there to the point where a term was coined for these people cord cutters because they were cutting their cable service and moving over to the new guy on the block. You can imagine that part, most of the, the bedrock of cable companies such as Comcast, most of their finances were built on uh, largely on their phone and cable services. Internet, while still being very, very lucrative, is not the bedrock of their service charges. If you look at, for example, your average person paying for internet um, from Comcast probably has some of the lower speed packages that aren't very expensive. However, their cable packages, even for basic ones without any premium channels, are actually pretty expensive. Why? Because they can. Um, they work out deals with a lot of uh, uh, network companies like Viacom as to uh, what content can be provided to what regions and and how much Viacom gets and how much Comcast gets and so on But here's the thing most people don't realize this part Comcast owns NBC Universal which also unto itself owns a slew of channels Yes, that means that Comcast owns both the distribution and the manufacture of content We're gonna get into that more in antitrust pretty soon, but keep that in mind distribution and production both owned by comcast that's a that's kind of a key key point to remember here the thing is though is that as more people were cord cutting moving over to netflix i can imagine that someone noticed a little bit of a dent in their profits namely cable companies and at one point so they managed to extort like specifically comcast was extorting netflix in order to not have their traffic throttled yes the stuff that people are saying that might happen without net neutrality was happening they were unduly throttling the traffic of of netflix unless netflix paid a monthly fee to comcast why no reason they claimed it was because they were having bandwidth issues but there's no bandwidth issues there never has been that's not the way their infrastructure works otherwise they would have been imposing uh you know daily limits on their users not monthly daily but there wasn't in any case moving on to the the next event uh on january 14 2014 verizon won their lawsuit over the fcc and the united states court of appeals for the district of columbia Verizon was suing over increased regulation on internet service providers on the grounds that even though the commission has general authority to regulate this area, it may not impose requirements that contravene the express statute mandates given that the commission has chosen to classify broadband providers in a manner that exempts them from treatment as common carriers. The Communications Act expressly prohibits the commission from nonetheless regulating them as such. After these setbacks in April of 2014, FCC issued a notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, which is essentially their laws, if you will. They're not really laws, they're not enforceable necessarily as laws, but they are kind of their laws there, uh, regarding the path forward for the open internet order. On November 10, 2014, President Obama recommended the FCC reclassify broadband internet service as a telecommunications service in order to preserve net neutrality. So here's the thing. Um, the, the, the Communications Act of 1934, that's what I was looking at here. Um, so here's the thing is that the Communications Act was um, something that was put into place a long time ago. And it was designed to regulate telephony companies. Um, 
you know, although I think there's actually stipulations in there for mail. Like, pretty much any form of communication you can imagine. Be it mail, be it whatever. The thing is, is that with that act, there has been several amendments of it over the years that kind of uh, added to it to keep up with times. Although it really hasn't kept up to the, uh, the actual digital age. See, here's the problem. Is the the Communications Act of 1934 and the Telecommunication Telecommunications Act of 1996 um, are laws passed by Congress. What the FCC was trying to do was put the internet communications industry under the umbrella of those acts, so they had legal authority to do what they needed to do. The problem was is that those guys pushed back really hard, lobbied, lobbied very heavily to try to get away, and Verizon actually did win. Um, and the judge didn't really want to rule against the FCC. <laughs> the guy actually pretty much, in his statement, uh, and I might pull that up a little bit later if we have time, but the judge in his statement was pretty much like, now FCC, you know that you know, I'm, I'm, as I'm reading over this, and I found out that in order for you to regulate them, they would have to be classified as Title II carriers. I'm just, I'm just saying, if you, if you, if you were to happen to, I don't know, classify them as Title II carriers, then I wouldn't be able to say anything. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, no to me, no to me. That's essentially where we were at is that we needed to have that level of classification in order to do it. The justification of it was that internet has become a mainstay. It is required for our daily lives in this modern day and age. Many people could debate that and say, hey, I can live just fine out in the woods with no no electricity and, and whatever. You know, you could say that a human can survive with those things. However, it's not about basic needs such as food, water, shelter. It's about integrating in modern society, and that is the debatable part. See, here's the thing, is that in modern society, like for example, to get a job, chances are you need to exchange emails with the work provider. You need to browse a website. You don't go door to door anymore looking for a job. Um, in order to communicate, chances are your job is going to use email. You're going to need to do, chances are you'll need to do learning in school on a computer nowadays from an internet because textbooks are ridiculously inexpensive. Fuck you, colleges. I know that book isn't worth 250 fucking dollars. You're lying. <laughs> no. Um, but the point is, is that a lot, everything around our society of life nowadays really revolves around the internet. Thus, their classification as them being a common carrier was kind of a natural just course of events. But they pushed back. And as I mentioned on there, this was back in 2015, um, whenever they actually applied the common carrier thing. And this is where people say that net neutrality was put into place was back in 2015. That was w just when the FCC put net neutrality uh, or put... Um, uh, they classified cable companies as common carriers. That's all they did. That's all they did in 2015 was just classified them as common carriers. They did not institute any additional rules on the internet providers. All they did was they put the internet service providers in the proper category in order to be able to enforce the laws that were already in, in existence 10 years previously that were meant for internet service providers in order for the FCC to enforce those rules that they had been around for a decade they had to classify internet service providers as common carriers and that's what they did but the rules of course prompted a debate and it became a partisan issue um, the Egypt Pi yes Commissioner Egypt Pi I know that sounds familiar right guys um, that the open internet order posed a special danger. Keep in mind, it's been around for a decade, guys. It's been around for a decade. He's just now saying it's posed a special danger. The First Amendment uh, speech, freedom of expression, and even freedom of association 
Yes, so essentially Egypt Pi said that preventing an internet service provider from, you know, enact, and we saw the rules on here. All it was doing is preventing, uh, and it was the three simple rules, right? Um, transparency, no blocking, and no unreasonable discrimination. These are all the, those are the three rules. Transparency, no blocking, no unreasonable discrimination. His response was that they, they were a special danger to free speech, freedom of expression, and freedom of association. By preventing someone from unduly subjugating you is not a violation of the First Amendment in any way. If I am cover, if you are protesting against something, and I come up and I cover your mouth, I cannot. Whenever a, a policeman arrests me for violating your free speech, I cannot therefore cite and say this law this policeman arresting me is posing a special danger to my free speech no because i was trying to censor someone else's free speech now the thing is is that that's where that is kind of the time in this 2015 timeline this is really where a lot of the free speech stuff got started and like saying that net neutrality would um would uh, uh not having net neutrality would pose a danger to free speech. And again, Tom Wheeler said, there is no more plan to regulate the, the internet than the First Amendment is a plan to regulate free speech. That's one of the things I loved about Tom Wheeler. Everybody was worried that Tom Wheeler, right, was uh, going to be uh, concerned because he was a... Um, he was a former lobbyist for telecom companies, I think for Verizon. Uh, and he said, and this guy who's a former lobbyist for telecom companies said that net, the net neutrality rules were no more plan to regulate the internet than the First Amendment is a plan to regulate free speech. And it's exactly right. It wasn't a plan to regulate anything. It was preventing ISPs from doing their own regulation. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, there's polls that show that a lot of people supported it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on March 2017, the FCC re uh, released special details of the net neutrality rules. On uh, April 13th, they published the final rules on the regulations and so on. Um, and then obviously in 2017, um, Egypt Pi is more or less wanting to repeal them. So here's the thing. This and this is where we're going to kind of get in there. You guys may have seen a clip floating around this like little gif of this is what the internet's gonna look like without um, inter without net neutrality. And uh, you may notice that it looks something like this right here. And if there's a little janky language on here, uh, you'll have to forgive me. This is I'm translating this to English from Portuguese. Um, and I'll explain that in a moment. So if anything looks a little weird and the language looks weird, that's just maybe because the translation's not working right. So in any case, you may have seen something that looks like this. Actually, the most common one is really outdated because it has like MySpace on there and shit, which has been dead for years. So in any case, this is the modern day version. So it's like plus SmartNet. Oh man, pay $4 a month to access Skype? Pay five dollars a month to access Facebook and Twitter and all this stuff. Oh my gosh, I'm having to pay money to access these sites. Man, that's crazy. How could they do that? Five dollars a month to access YouTube and Twitch. <gasps> that's in violation of net neutrality. This is what it looks like if there's no net neutrality, guys. Oh my gosh, five dollars a month just to access Spotify. I already have to pay for Spotify. Oh my gosh. This is a little horseshit. You're already getting an internet, okay? You're paying. You're paying. This is this is actually so people try to cite that this is this is the bra, or the landline internet in Portugal. No, the landline internet in Portugal 
looks pretty much exactly the same as what we have. Yeah, guess what? They've got packages with telephone and cable. Yeah, just like fucking Comcast in the United States. By the way, this is this is the Comcast, uh, or this is the Xfinity of Portugal, in case you guys are wondering. Um, yeah, it just looks exactly the same. There's, there's no real difference there. It's different internet speeds, packaged with phone or cable service. You guys know how this works. It's just like every ISP in the United States work. No difference. Okay. Actually, um, you can actually, they, they, you know what? They actually are a little bit more forward thinking. You can get a PS4, a PS4 and FIFA 18 for 10, uh, 10 euros a month for 26 months. So they let you like um, pay for uh, like a, a finance finance a ps4 and fifa 18 that's that's pretty forward thinking for an isp i will say that they try to get people into gaming um you don't see any of that shit in the united states where they actually give you a, a gaming console <laughs> but yeah so in any case this is their their mobile packages this is for their cell phone service so this would be like something verizon's offering and so what do they have they have um three they have their four different packages and you may recognize this from what Verizon had not long ago before they brought back Unlimited. Thank you, Verizon, for not being dipshits. Um, but this is pretty similar to what they had there. You've got mobile internet, right? 500 megabytes, one gigabyte, three gigabyte, 30 gigabytes. Oh, and hey, you know, you even get some bonus data for ordering online. And then you get your minute plans and your text messages and all that shit. It's pretty much the same damn thing that you would see with a US carrier except you have the addition of SmartNet. What this does is you pay a flat monthly move, a flat monthly fee like 4.99 a month and these plans are exempted from your data plan. You still have data, right? You still have your your month your you know, you say you get this XL package up here, right? You still have 30 gigabytes, well, 30.5 gigabytes of data per month. And then you can add these extra guys here, right? Um, and actually, all that gives you is 10 extra gigabytes per month. It doesn't translate very well here, it looks like. Um, yeah. So it looks like what it's saying is, is that essentially you make a monthly payment and then you get 10 extra gigabytes of data for these services. So say for example, I pay $5 a month, or actually it's more like seven euros a month, and I get extra data for YouTube. I get extra data for Facebook, or I can get extra data for Skype, or for Spotify, or for email, or whatever, uh, or these, these are free. So if you notice, free traffic to Mio apps uh, is included with your price. This is actually what that meme was about. And you were misled into thinking this is how their landline services work. And if you don't pay these monthly fees, you are blocked from accessing them. That is bullshit. That is not what these are. These are exempting them from your current data plan. You can access them no matter what you will always have access to them. It's just that it gives you, if you use these services a lot, you can pay a flat monthly fee to have extra data for them so you don't go over your data cap. Especially, I'm surprised that YouTube and Twitch aren't higher priced to be frankly honest, because they use a lot more data than a, pretty much all these other services since they're streaming video. But I digress, whatever. The point is, is that there is that meme floating around that's complete and utter nonsense that is trying to claim that once net neutrality goes away that somehow magically you're going to have to start paying to access YouTube or paying to access Facebook that the um, that a lot of these providers like Comcast is going to start tra uh, charging end users to use basic websites like Facebook or YouTube. That's not going to happen. And I'm going to explain why. So first of all, despite the, the grossly unpopular um, nature of doing that and, you know, how many complaints they probably get, 
the thing is, is that Comcast doesn't need to do that. Follow my logic on here. And let's go ahead and move on to talking about antitrust laws. So free and open markets are the foundation of a vibrant economy. Aggressive competition among sellers in an open marketplace, uh, marketplace gives consumers, both individuals and businesses, the benefit of lower prices, higher quality products and services, more choices, and greater innovation. The FTC's competition mission is to enforce the rules of the competitive marketplace, the antitrust laws. These laws promote vigorous competition and protect consumers from anti-competitive mergers and business practices. A lot of fucking good that's done so far. The FTC's Bureau of Competition, working in tandem with the Bureau of Economics, enforces the antitrust laws and benefits of the consumers. Antitrust, for those of you who don't know, is whenever you hear terms like, um, you know, anti-competitive or anti-consumer, those are usually falling under like supposition of antitrust. Antitrust is essentially to prevent one company from owning everything and having ultimate control, right? Um, there was a joke, I believe, in the movie Demolition Man, where um, there was corporate wars at some point in time and Taco Bell won. So now you would go um, to the Taco Bell restaurant, which Taco Bell restaurant serves all foods, not just tacos, right? They, they serve Italian, they serve whatever. But then you would also go to Taco Bell Bank. And then you would also go to uh, the, the uh, Taco Bell movie theater. You know, like everything was Taco Bell. That's kind of a joke, but that is, uh, that's what's known as a monopoly. One company owns both the production and distribution of services to uh, for a specific market. So, and here's the thing, is that it's kind of tricky, and this is the reason why they have special bureaus for investigating this, um, is because um, monopolies are generally kind of viewed as um, Ma Bell, um, which I'm actually gonna look that up, the Bell telephone system, um, really quick. Um, so that that way we can go over that one as well, because I feel like that um, that's actually going to be a, a necessary um, topic of discussion on here. The reason why is because Bell is a, a kind of a <laughs> spurious. Thank you so much, sir. Welcome and thank you for for joining us here. Um, in any case, um, so. The Bell Telephone System, or the Bell System, or also known as Ma Bell, was a telephone company that had a rather aggressive monopoly throughout the United States, and I believe in Canada as well. Um, they had the American Bell Telephone System, and then eventually the national one. The thing is, is that, and, and obviously they evolved, the American Bell Telephone System evolved into the American Telephone and Telegraph Company. Now that sounds familiar. And your chat's broken again, Spurious. Why is your chat broken again? Um, no, 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 no. This is not. This is not Bell. Um, is this is long preceding the current Bell in Canada? Um, we're talking about the Bell Telephone Company, um, which actually had a monopoly of both the United States and Canada back in the 18 and early 1900s. Um, <laughs> My light is blinding right, not hot red. Yes. Um, so the thing is, is that, uh, let me actually get down to the, see if we can get to the, the antitrust section of this here. Ah, I need to go back up to the top here. Um, the thing is, uh, let's see, divestiture. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So this is kind of the section that we need to get to here. Oh, God damn it. I hate scrolling through this here. Okay. So, was it in 1899? Yeah. Um, so, significant criticism of AT&T, a monopoly, had emerged in the United States that domestic telephone system rates were higher than they needed to be and that AT&T was using those revenues to subsidize its European operations. Due to that reason and others, and also due to the U.S. government's regulation intervention, AT&T President Walter Gifford, 
divested almost all of its international interest in 1925, with the exception of the Bell Telephone Company in Canada, as you called it, Spurious, and that's all that's left of the great and mighty uh, Ma Bell is actually, well, there's several small pieces of it that are all around the place. Um, but uh, in any case though, the European division and subsidiaries were sold to the international, or it and unaffiliated with at and and the start of the company's meteoric rise in the inter international telecommunications industry. In any case, so there's been a lot of, of shady shit that's gone on with Be Ma Bell. It is largely the reason why the United States has antitrust laws to begin with, was because they owned Canada and the United States, all the telephone communications, and then they were spreading into Europe and using all of their, they were jacking up the prices in the United States in order to feel expansion and taking over um, the European, well, uh, European Union was, I don't think around then. I can't remember at this point, but they were using that to feel their spread across Europe. They would have eventually had control of all of Europe as well. And it was just kind of like, they were so powerful. They controlled communications. Think about that for a moment. You think, how gr for granted do you take talking on the telephone nowadays? You call someone, you send a text message, right? And in that, more to that point, you talk about your general use of internet is also was started by telephone communications. Ma Bell owned it all, all of it. Every single piece, every telephone, everywhere, they owned it. <laughs> so needless to say, they got broken apart. They got divested, which just means the company got broke apart into small pieces, right? Um, the thing is, is the problem is that when they divested that, that was their benchmark of what a monopoly was. That international conglomerate that owned telephones across North America and Europe. That was their idea of a monopoly. But that's not the only example of a monopoly. A monopoly could also be a company that owns the, both the production and the distribution of a market that is much smaller. For example, many areas throughout the United States have one option for an internet service provider. <laughs> Ah, okay, yeah, better TVs. Uh, BTTV sometimes is, uh, they're owned by Comcast. <gasps> no, I'm just kidding. No, they're not. <laughs> but no, the, uh, um, in general, uh, that's what they used as benchmark for Monopoly was the Bell system, was Ma Bell. Uh, the downside, though, was that whenever they go to look at places, uh, companies like Comcast, they don't see it as a monopoly because Comcast doesn't operate all through the United States. There's there's uh, AT and T in some regions, and there's uh, Time Warner in some regions, and there's Verizon in some regions. Um, so that Comcast doesn't own all of the internet. Yeah, it's, a, it's that short game, right? Yeah, this is anybody after uh, after you know playing Monopoly for three hours with their grandma. Screw you, grandma. Um, the thing is, is that monopolies can exist on small regional areas, which is what a lot of cable companies or some ADSL companies around the United States and in other countries operate. There's no competition to them, um, to the point where there was actually even a, a meme, kind of a meme joke made in South Park, where uh, essentially someone calls the cable company to complain. He's like, oh, what are you going to do? Go somewhere else? <laughs> no, you, you, you can't. There's no other choice. Here is where net neutrality kind of comes in. What it does is it imposes that these internet service providers who already are entrenched in a monopoly, it prevents them from using that monopoly to unduly control internet traffic. What it does not do is it does not prevent them from uh, or, or ensure that they can't silence your free speech because that's a whole another level of nonsense that they would get into for that. However, what it does, net neutrality does prevent, and this is kind of where we're going to uh, get in here with this, is it does prevent 
um, antitrust. So what, without net neutrality, what an internet service provider could do? Um, yeah, the service in areas where where they have it, like in, in this area, for example, I'll, I'll give an example of, of how a regional monopoly works, right? Uh, in my area, there are two internet services. There is uh, CenturyLink, who is an ADSL monopoly owner. They're essentially the Comcast of ADSL. Um, they have abysmal speed to my house. I'm not kidding. Uh, I think I w they offered me 10 megabits, uh, 10 megabit download speed, and like 768k uh, upload speed. Um, I'm not kidding. 7 768k upload speed, right? Uh, Comcast, Comcast offers upwards of uh, 250 meg uploads or uh, download speed uh, and 25 meg upload speed. That's the top tier that I can get here, um, which is to be fair, not horrible, but they charge $250, $250 for that, I believe. No, sorry, $200 for that. Um, and that I'm ch counting the $200 in that as, uh, and I might be miscounting that because I haven't checked in a while. Um, they also, you also have to pay an additional $50 to have unlimited data, which as a streamer, kind of required for me because otherwise I get over on my data cap every month. There's no options here. Conversely, if you were to go to a region that has say Google Fiber in it, you pay $70 a month for one gigabit upload and download with no data cap. $70. $70. That's it. Not 200 for 250 megabyte upload or uh, download and 25 upload. Yeah. That's that's what we're looking at. That's what happens when you have a monopoly in an area. Um, because CenturyLink is no competition to them. Comcast owns the cable and distribution market for you know internet in this area and therefore they can offer rather subpar although passable uh, internet speed rates and charge exorbitant rates for them because they control the market they determine the price and almost everybody here has comcast and everybody i talk to hates them with a passion they don't like them right so that's what a monopoly looks like and that's what Comcast has in many regions of the United States. AT&T has a monopoly in, uh, in other areas. And uh, Time Warner has a monopoly in some areas. Verizon has a monopoly in some areas. They each have their turf. And they really usually don't overlap that much. Because they don't want to compete with each other. They have their turf. They stay on their turf and they're quite content there. They, they just increase in profits. Yeah, see, and that's, that's the case. Is that like... When you go into rural areas, it gets even more ridiculous in more rural areas. I'm not in a rural area. I'm in a suburb of fucking Portland. One of the largest cities in the United States. Not nearly, not even in the top 10, I don't think. I think it's like in the top 30 largest cities in the U.S. But it's still a large metropolis. And that's what I get. Right? So here's the thing. What comcast could do if they did not have any net neutrality preventing them from doing so they could impose a fine on um services like netflix or amazon video i use those two specifically and not the other third big name in there for a very specific reading uh rating uh yeah there's millions of people in portland portland is very it's a pretty large city here um it's definitely not new york city it's definitely not los angeles but it's pretty large um but in any case so here's the thing this is what actually is going to happen um <laughs> apparently major's trying to distract me by saying that uh that there's new trailers and stuff major Oh gosh. Anyway, um, gotta gotta tell him to stop stop pinging me. Anyway, um, 
So here's the thing is that without those protections on there, they could start imposing a fine on Amazon Video or Netflix. Um, and if Netflix or Amazon Video did not pay them, they could start to throttle their speed. Or they could not charge them any fine and still throttle their speed. And then coincidentally, um, they could, you know, then you could see Hulu. Hulu magically has 4K streaming. Oh, and it doesn't even use my Comcast data plan. Because, fun fact, if you didn't know, the major um, owner of Hulu is NBC Universal. Remember who I said owns NBC Universal? Comcast. Yeah, so you could be like, Hulu doesn't use any of your data. And, uh, and it also streams at 4K. Whereas Netflix and Amazon Video, man, you only get 480p streaming out of that. That's standard definition. That's like 20 years ago. Oh my gosh. How could anybody do that? Well, technically, there's no net neutrality preventing them from doing that. So they can throttle them. They're not technically, um, you know, in any way forcing them out of business. They're not buying up their competition. They're just making it dip more difficult for their competition, right? That's the issue on here. That's really the big problem is that they could force out competition just by making it difficult. Netflix does have 4K content. Good luck fucking getting 4K content on any of the places because frankly, it's, uh, it's tough to have that bandwidth in most places unless you have Google Fiber. That's pretty much it. Um, you also have to have their highest package, I believe, to get the 4K streaming, um, whatever their highest package for Netflix is. Um, if you have any, because they, they have like three or four tiers, um, and if you have the, any of the lower tiers, you don't get the 4K streaming. Not like it would really, I wouldn't buy it anyway because I couldn't stream 4K video, to be frankly honest. Um, I couldn't handle it. But here's the thing, is that what they could do people are worried about comcast or other big internet service providers charging for additional packages to act access basic websites that we use every day like netflix or whatever what i posit instead is that they wouldn't need to because they could just muscle those guys out of the industry just by making it difficult because they control the roads right um it <laughs> It, that's that's really all it is is that they would control the roads and if they can uh, give uh, you know Hulu or say X1 uh, or Xfinity X1 streaming service which is actually Comcast's own in-house streaming service that uh, that piggybacks off of their uh, cable they could give those guys access to HOV lane and nobody else everybody else is stuck in rush hour traffic but those guys get the, the special fast lane, um, which makes their service undo, give, uh, gives their service an unfair advantage in the market. And that's where we come into antitrust laws, right? Um, is that it is giving their services that they would have uh, an unfair advantage. Now here is the, 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 the argument for and against, right? Here's the ask, is that net neutrality prevents anybody from unduly uh, giving uh, one service an unfair advantage over the other. It also requires transparency and, uh, and no blocking of any sites. However, what the argument against net neutrality is, is that um, the, the, the true argument against net neutrality is technically um, such uses might technically fall under the FTC's jurisdiction not the FCC's right and that is really the, the question on there now the government is not going to be censoring internet in the United States that's not going to happen at all and the government if net neutrality was around the, there's no rules in net neutrality that says the government can censor us that's never been there net neutrality has been around for in, in one form or another for the past 12 years and the government has done no censoring people censor themselves in uh, in the kind of echo chambers that are created within facebook um, as it curates your content same with twitter same with youtube all, all the content created there you essentially kind of 
censor yourself in certain ways. But um, aside from that, the real the real thing is is that it doesn't give the government extra power to to control the internet. It doesn't also uh, the lack thereof does not give internet service providers the right to infringe upon your free speech. Both are false. Um, what it does do is it does um, kind of act as a preventative measure against antitrust, which technically is the FTC's jurisdiction. The FCC does regulate telecom companies already to prevent against antitrust, so it's kind of a weird, uh, so we're a symbiosis there between the two. Should the FCC have those preventions in place? I think so. Because it's not just, even though they are trying to, uh, the open internet rules are still going to be in place whether or not the net neutrality is there. What is essentially not going to be there is the ability to apply those to internet service providers specifically. Other people can still fall under that um, technically, I guess, but that's another topic entirely. <sighs> the Canada's better regulation of our services. It could be better, but then there seem like a lot more options. Uh, to be fair, Canada's not really in much of a better shape um, from my understanding because you guys still have a lot of the issues. Um, for example, your cell phone service really, really sucks. Um, I, I know that one for certain. And also, uh, a lot of your internet services aren't very well provisioned for either and don't have very good infrastructure set up, except if you live in one of the bigger cities like uh, like Vancouver, Toronto, um, you know, Quebec City, or, or what have you. But aside, the other argument I hear is, damn, that sucks for you people in the United States. Uh, that sucks for you guys, and I feel bad for you. The truth of it is, as it's not necessarily just the United States issue. Um, now, firstly, uh, a lot of countries, uh, for example, like uh, Australia in particular and New Zealand, have pretty strict consumer protection laws. In fact, I personally think they're a little bit too strict. Um, if you Google search games that have been banned in, the, uh, in Australia, you'll kind of understand why I think a lot of their laws are too strict there. But they do have um, this kind of function called consumer law. And in consumer law, they actually can protect a lot of uh, the actions that might be taken against the consumer by a corporation. Um, and that's that's really something that's nice in theory as long as it's not overstepped. However, there are a little bit better ones in the EU and that uh, are a little bit more um, light. <laughs> um, but here's the big thing is is that what people don't realize is that how it affects the rest of the world is that a lot of the competition for internet service providers such as Netflix and Amazon video guess where they're based in the United States so now while Amazon is not going anywhere um, I doubt Comcast could muscle them out of the industry because I'm pretty certain that Amazon has more money than Comcast which is saying a of a lot <laughs> yeah uh, I think they're actually secretly the rules rulers of the world at this point and we just haven't realized it yet but once the Amazon AI robots rise up and uh, overthrow all the world governments all simultaneously then we'll realize that they've been the overlords the whole time Bezos is of course an Android sent from the future um, in order to take over the world um, uh, aside from that Netflix could very much be muscled out. Um, they are very much at the mercy of internet service providers and they could be wiped off the face of the map all over the world, not just in the United States. Will, uh, will ISPs magically start censoring your content or, or preventing you from going to websites? No. But what they can do is they can actually uh, force companies that you might go to they can force them out of business if they're com if they see them as a threat and see them as competition, and that really is, in summary, the real truth behind net neutrality. Take away all the myths. Net neutrality is a prevention against antitrust.
And that's something that I guess a lot of people don't understand. And you get a lot of misinformation making you think that it's some free speech issue. It's not a free speech issue. It's not a partisan issue. I don't fucking care if you support Clinton, Trump, fucking Al Green or Al Sharpton. I don't care. Trudeau, if you support Trudeau, as misled as you Canadians might be, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, no, it doesn't matter who you support. It is not a political party faction. It is consumers versus corporations. And that's not a partisan issue. That is a natural state of being. There is a certain dichotomy that gets formed between the consumer and the corporations. Consumers want all the consumer money. Or co corporations want all the consumer money. Consumers want all of the corporations products, right? You have that that dynamic, that abrasion that happens there, and you have to balance how much money of the, uh, of the consumers does the corporation get, and how much product of the corporations does the consumer get. That there has to be a, a back and forth. <laughs> it's true, though. <laughs> uh, but no, there has to be uh, there has to be that balance there, right? The downside is is that corporations are naturally more powerful than the consumer is. The consumer, granted, does have the money, but when I mean power, I don't necessarily mean um, the money. I mean as in they know the enemy better, so to speak. Not enemy, I mean metaphorically speaking. Um, they know the consumer better than the consumer knows the corporation. Because you see how much misinformation out there? People don't even realize what a corporation is, even categorically. They don't understand that it is literally a business entity that is controlled by a group of people. And can uh, those people are authoritatively allowed to act as a single entity, i.e. they can act as a person. Yes, did you know that corporations are considered people? The U.S. is a fucked up country. Anyway, the thing is, is that that's the only real fight that's going on here. You have three parties you have the corporations the government and the consumer the government should be protecting the consumer not protecting the corporation what we're seeing Egypt Pi do is protect the corporations that is not the government's job the corporations can protect themselves that in and of itself is a protection of the free and open capitalistic market is for them not to <laughs> not to do that you know fun fact about incorpora uh, incarcerating corporations um look up iceland um jails uh executives from a bank um i can't remember what it was it was years ago back in the housing market crash um the government of iceland like jailed a bunch of bank like cor uh, of executives for a bank it was great Kudos to you, Iceland. Send them all to jail. Anyway, so that's kind of been my rant on net neutrality. Chances are it's going away tomorrow. You probably won't notice any difference, at least at first. Um, more than likely what you'll hear about uh, in maybe a year or two is that Netflix uh, is starting to get charged a fee to access the fast lanes again. They've already, by the way, that's already been done before. The net neutrality rules was prevent was actually instituted in the wake of Comcast charging Netflix a fee to access fast lanes on the internet, and they were deliberately throttling Netflix if Netflix didn't pay. That already happened. <laughs> you look it up. Uh, actually, you know what? You know what? Let's. I'm not gonna tell you to look it up. Let's let's look it up together. Let's do that so that you actually have the facts. Over the last 12 years, uh, I don't give a fuck about that. That's not nonsense. For the past several months, and this was, by the way, in uh, 2014. They don't actually have the 
date on here, but this was, this was back in 2014, so a few years ago. For the last several months, Comcast's internet customers have complained about a drop in quality of the Netflix streams being delivered to their homes, and Netflix's own data showed a massive decline in connection speeds in October. But today, the two companies announced they have reached a mutually beneficial agreement to turn the trend around. Much like Netflix's ongoing standoff with Verizon Fios, yes, not just Comcast, the drop in speed wasn't an issue of ISP throttling or blocking. Yeah, that's right. Um, rather, the ISPs were allowing Netflix to, uh, <laughs> to bottleneck in what's known as peering ports, the connections between Netflix bandwidth provider and the ISPs. So they got around the whole thing. They're not throttling them deliberately. They're just allowing the speeds to back up. Right. Tell me that ain't a bunch of shady bullshit. And then the result of it is that they actually, um, you know, they, they would agreed to pay a fee to Comcast and Verizon because Comcast and Verizon claimed they were being taken advantage of. Comcast was claiming they were being taken advantage. Comcast, guys. Comcast. So yeah, that is what they actually already did. So that was back in early 2014. Um, yeah, that already happened. You're saying that net, net neutrality isn't needed? Except they've already been doing exactly what net neutrality is supposed to be preventing. The reason why net neutrality was put into place is because of this right here. So for all of you people that think that it's some kind of farce created by Google and Netflix and these people that try to trick you, no, it's not. It's all publicly viewable. It's government and they're required to be transparent about it. So if you wanted to find out what net neutrality was about, really about, instead of believing all the bullshit that you see floating around Facebook, you could actually look it up yourself and see what it was really about. Don't believe the whole nonsense from that someone misquoted this post from Mio, because this is entirely not what you were led to believe. But do believe that, that the lack of net neutrality will it undoubtedly lead to antitrust violations that are probably not going to be well enforced by the FTC because a lot of the FTC's authority has been gutted over the years. That's the sad truth of it. God, that was a depressing end. Um, do people not pay to access whatever the heck they want? The issue is that the ISP should never be able to choose what they want specifically want to allow uh, your advertised bandwidth to be used for. That is 100% true. That is very, very true. Um, so those packages, these, these packages here, um, this, this, is, uh, this is actually kind of a meme here, by the way. This is not true, right? The, the context that, that you miss whenever you see this is that you're already paying for tiered internet. You're, you, you know what this is. Everybody knows what this is. Your standard tiered internet. And guess what? Portugal and this is all across the EU. You get the same thing. Um, <laughs> all national network. And, and you don't pay anything extra for Spain, which is nice. Um, but yeah, so your same tiered internet packages. This merely exempts these services from your internet package. That's all it does. However, it's been tricked on you to believe that it's somehow you're not allowed to access those sites unless you pay that fee. No, you can still access them no matter what. This just allows you to access them more than you might normally because you don't have to worry about your data plan anymore. That's really what it's about. I'm repeating myself though at this point, which is uh, which is not, not my intention here. So I think that is, uh, <laughs> oof, we went on for 90 minutes ranting about net neutrality, guys. 90 minutes on here so oh for fuck's sake ash playing casino front two. <laughs> oh, all right so i think that uh yeah 
got size 16 he's he looks like he's having a good time playing some dragon age origins and not casino front 2 god i'm never gonna let that that the game is never gonna lose live that down ever by the way um it's going to forever be forever be my phone's cap is 3.5 gigabytes per month um i actually don't have a cap because i am a rebel that is that is a very true statement um I, I just I they they said I had a data plan and I told them no I really don't I do whatever the fuck I want and I threw the phone at them. By the way, I recommend against throwing phones at um, an actual cellular service provider. They don't take it well. <laughs> oh gosh, I really need to uh, like I don't know brain or something. Nice. There we go. All right. Anyway, we're going to go ahead and throw a host over to Psy16 over on his channel. He's playing some Dragon Age Origins. Pretty chill guy. And uh, and and ask him about his thoughts on net neutrality. Um, I have no idea what he would say. I, I really don't. He'd probably be like, yeah, it, it sucks. He's from Texas, though, so... Um, if the internet providers there tried to like throttle their internet, um, they have guns and a lot of them. So there is that. <laughs> All right, guys. So we're going to go ahead and get it kind of closed up over here. <laughs> you use rabbit ears with your, with your aluminum hat. I do actually, um, I had them. Not only are they rabbit ears, but I had my aluminum hat crafted by an actual rabbit believe it or not um i find that having a rabbit craft it means that i'm less susceptible to the alien rays coming from the spaceships that are floating in our sky right now but they're invisible so you can't see them and they're also um intangible so you um can't feel them and stuff i'm going to see myself out now <laughs> All right, guys. Anyway, um, so tomorrow morning, um, we're going to be at 9 a.m. We're going to be doing another Pixel, Pixel Crashers podcast. Um, I promise I will try to keep the talk about net neutrality. Uh, wait, what day is today? Today's Wednesday. What the fuck am I thinking? I'm trying to pretend like it's Friday, by the way, guys. No, tomorrow is not a Pixel Crashers podcast. Tomorrow is no stream. Friday, we'll be back with some Divinity New Original Sin again. And then Saturday... This Saturday, we'll have a Pixel Crashers podcast, which of course will probably uh, mention net neutrality, at least in the sense of lamenting the fact that it was repealed, because it's going to be repealed, undoubtedly. Um, and then we'll talk about other stuff, but not necessarily net neutrality, because that would be kind of redundant at this point, because we already talked about it today. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we'll throw this over to Size 16. If you're checking this out after the fact on YouTube, you can find links down below to find uh, the Twitch stream here and come join us live because it's fun times. Anyway, guys, have a good night. And I will be back in two days. God, I hope so. Oh, hopefully Comcast doesn't censor this because, uh, because I'm speaking out against them. 